This morning we continue our series about the Apostles' Creed. Last week, Trent illuminated the role of the Holy Spirit. It was quite a sermon. Today, Chris is going to talk about I believe in the Holy Universal Church. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. To the Church of God in Corneth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have given us our word, your word that we may come to understand you better. And Father, we pray as Pastor Chris comes to deliver your message today that our hearts and minds would be open to your word and changed forever by the teaching of your word. And Father, we pray that you would anoint Chris to deliver the message exactly as you desire it. Father, we just thank you that you've called us here this morning, either in person or in the air. And Father, we pray that we would glorify you as we will worship. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Crucified, died, and was buried. El the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Creo el Espíritu Santo. The Holy Universal Church. The communion of the saints. La remissão dos pecados. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Well, as I have spent the better part of this week getting ready for this sermon and reflecting on the church, there's one thing that has become abundantly clear to me as I prepared this week, and it's so important that I have to preempt the entire sermon with this thing. You cannot talk about the holy universal church or the communion of saints without seeing the foundational nature and the implications of the gospel that it has on every aspect of the church. Every part of the church has to do with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You can't preach. I can't talk to you about the holy church without talking to you about the holiness of God, without talking to you about a God who created the world, a God who condescended out of heaven and and came to earth, who suffered and who died and was buried and rose again and ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father and send his spirit as our helper. I can't talk about the Holy Church, which has been set apart. You, believer, I can't talk about you as a holy church without talking about the God who is sanctified, who has washed, who has cleansed, who has set you apart for his purposes. I can't tell you about the universal church. I can't tell you about the church worldwide across time and space. I can't tell you about that without telling you about the God that created the universe and everything in it just by the word of his power and who created man to bear his image. I can't tell you about the church without telling you about the gospel that takes people that look different takes people that live differently, takes people that eat differently, that are all across the world. I can't tell you about the church without telling you about the God who unites all of those people through the power of the cross, breaking down the hostility and uniting two different people into one in the body of Christ. I can't tell you about the community of saints, the love that we have for one another 
as we have Jesus Christ as the head of our church. I can't tell you about the communion that we have with one another without telling you about a loving God who sent his son to this world to rescue sinners that were once enemies but now are one. I can't talk to you about the church without proclaiming the gospel. There is no church without the gospel. A gospel that's preached to the poor, a gospel that frees the captives, a gospel that gives sight to the blind, a gospel that has proclaimed that this is the year of the Lord and the oppressed are crushed no more. Know this morning, church family, that there again is no church without the gospel. There's no people of God without a God that's for his people. And so this morning, it's kind of simple. We use one verse and we'll jump off on that verse on the different aspects of the church throughout scripture. And we're gonna use 1 Corinthians 1, 2 to do that. And we're gonna talk about the holiness of the church. We're gonna talk about the church is universal and we're gonna talk about the communion that we have with the saints. And so first, let's look at the holiness of the church. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. This is the beginning of the, of the letter and he's, he's, he's giving the greeting, and then this is the address to who he is writing. And so he says this, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. So right away, we see two aspects that remind us and show us the holiness of the church. Paul is, is telling them that they are set apart, that they are different. Right? And the first way we see that is just in that word church that Paul uses. It's the word ecclesia. And I'll tell you, it's not as fun to say as ruah, like Trent did last week. But nevertheless, it's the word that we've been given, ecclesia. It means literally called out ones. The church, that word means called out ones, separated ones. There should be something different. You are called out. You are not of this world. You are called out. And so Paul is reminding the church in Corinth that you are separate from this world. And that should mean something. Because if you remember the church in Corinth that we studied about, they weren't all that put together, were they? They had a lot of stuff going on. But yet here Paul is saying that you are called out, reminding them that you're different than what you see around you. And you should look different. And then right there, Paul, he, he specifies again, in case it wasn't clear, he emphasizes to them that next part of the verse, he says, to those sanctified in Christ. So not only does he use that word church called out ones, but then he emphasizes that this is what that means to those that are sanctified. That word sanctified, it, it means that you are becoming more like Christ, that you are holy, that you are separate from this world. And so you ident he's identifying the church in Corinth with the holy, sanctified, set apart ones of God. So just in two short phrases, we see that Paul, again, is reminding the church that they look different than the world. But how? Right? He, he hints at that in the verse and when he says, to those sanctified in Christ, but, but how, what's the mechanism that sets us apart, believers apart from the world? And I'm gonna put it very simply and we're gonna look at Ephesians 2 to check it out. It says this, you are called out, as a believer, you are called out by being brought near and you are brought near by the blood of Christ. Look at Ephesians 2. It says this, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He's talking to the, now a church in Ephesus is saying, listen, you were once separate from God's kingdom. You were once a part of God's kingdom and not in the good set apart sense, in the bad set apart sense. You looked like this world. You were strangers, you were aliens. aliens. You didn't know the covenantal promise keeping God. You were separate, and what's the result of that? No hope, no hope in this world. But of course, as the gospel tells us, that's not where we end the story. He keeps going, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? You who were once separate, you who were once not holy have now been brought near and together 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only qualification, church, for being included in the holy church of God is to be a sinner who was once far off, who has now been saved and has brought near to the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only qualification to be a part of God's holy church. Ed Clowney says it like this. He says, the church is a holy nation, a set apart nation, not just ideally, but actually, because it is composed of people who are united to Christ in God's electing love and effectual calling. He says that you are, because you are united to Christ, you have, been, you have been called, you have been chosen, you have been elected to be a part of this holy nation. And how did you get in? By his effectual calling, by him calling you into the kingdom. This is not you walking into the kingdom. This is God working by the power of the spirit to bring you from a faraway land into the kingdom, into the church, into the holy nation of God. You see, the church is holy because God has deemed it holy through his saving work. And this saving work on the cross calls you out of darkness, calls you from far away, and brings you near into his glorious light. And that's a beautiful, beautiful truth that you have as a believer, as a part of God's holy church. He says, that, and by the way, this is not just like a New Testament thing. This is an Old Testament thing too. This is a part of God's people, one people, one God. And he says this in Leviticus, you shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Do you see the emphasis on that? That the people are his, the people are separated because he is holy. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 7, keeps going with this idea. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And I love this. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you. It wasn't because what you did. It wasn't because of all the wonderful things about you. No, no. He chose you, for you were the fewest, but it is because the Lord loves you. That's the qualification. That's the mechanism. That is the hope that we have in the gospel. That's why I can't preach about the church without showing you the hope that God has chosen you, that has taken you out of darkness and placed you into his church. And Moses, in this, in this book, Deuteronomy, he goes on to say that because God has set you apart, therefore now be holy. He says that follow the statutes, be reminded of this beautiful covenant that God has given to his people. And so as the new Israel, the church must continue to walk in holiness just as they, just as they did in the Old Testament. Peter writes this, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In another place, Paul says, let us labor or let us lay aside every weight. He has called you out of darkness, so now therefore walk in light. This is an active work of God's grace in your life that enables the church to fight to maintain what's already been said, what's already true about it, that you are holy. The Westminster Shorter Catechism is really helpful as we try to understand what it means to be set apart, to be sanctified. It says this, sanctification is the work of God's free grace. Do you see the emphasis of the, it's a work, first of all, by the way. It's not an act. It's something that's ongoing. And so it's a work of what? It's of God's free grace, not your work, but rather what God is doing to call you to make you look more like him. And it keeps going. It says, whereby, so this is a result of God's work in your life, whereby we are re renewed in the whole image of God. I love this because it doesn't say the whole, the renewed in the whole image of you or covenant church or anything like that. It says the whole image of God as a, as a bearer of God's image, you were to look more like him. 
It says, and, and you are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. And so God's free gift to you, because you have been set apart, is for you to now look more and more like Jesus Christ by setting aside all that hinders you to, to, to go after the good news of, of Jesus Christ and to live and to look more like his righteousness that he has already given to you in the gospel. Well, why does God actually care about holiness? It might seem like a weird question, but my guess is that either someone has asked you that question or you may have been living your life to the effect that God doesn't care about holiness in his church. And I think it's really helpful to think about why God cares about our holiness by thinking about it from God's perspective. And as I did that this week, I. I came across this kind of idea where it would kind of be like where, where if you had a, had a child and the child was born and after the child was born, you basically were like, you know what? I'm good. The child is a part of my family. I'm, I'm happy that the child is a part of my family. I don't care if the child grows. I don't really care if they grow in maturity. I don't care if they, they end up in prison. I don't care if they have an education. I don't care if they look more and more like, like Christ. I just... Th- all I care about is they're in my family, and that's all I really need. Of course, that sounds ridiculous, but what does a parent do, right? What do we do with our little, little Shayla, right, that, I, that, that is part of our family? No, we, we tell her things like, like, no, it's not good to throw food on the ground, how many times do we have to tell you it's not good? It's not good manners, right? She's 16 months old, by the way. And I tell her, no, it's not good to run into the street. That's not good for you. We're shaping her. And yes, let's pray before the meal. Let's pray before bed. Let's read stories of God's word together. That kind of goes well, kind of doesn't each time, you know. (laughs) But I care. We care about her growth to look more like the creature that God has created her to be. As she is enjoying the benefits of being a part of this covenantal family that we all who belong to Christ enjoy. So how much more, though, does God care about our holiness if I am caring about my little Shayla? And God, as a loving God, we are a part of his family. He is, he is the head of, of, of the church. He is the head of the family. But he doesn't just want us to, to, to come to know him and say, I'm good, thanks, I'm gonna walk on my way, have a nice day. That's not how God works He desires us to look more and more like him in holiness. And so I gotta tell you, this is why church discipline is so, so important. And I know that we've talked about church discipline recently in one of Trent's sermons, but you know that Trent does like two years of a sermon series. And so it was a little while ago, it was, it was, it was in the first Corinthians that I think we started two years ago and just finished. So I wanna remind you of, of stuff that he talked about in that sermon because church discipline is so, so important. Proper church discipline is so important. Let me say this, church discipline, it's a beautiful mark of a faithful church who takes seriously God's call for the church to be holy. Church discipline done well, it's a beautiful tool of grace that God has given the church to help the church look different from this world. Again, just like a loving father or parent or mother will will discipline the child for their good, so God desires the church to lovingly discipline those that are in the church. In fact, in Matthew 16, he talks about this. Jesus, he's talking about building the church, and he he says this to the disciples. I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I'll tell you, this is a humbling, humbling task that that, that Christ has given to the church. And I wanna be clear about this. Church discipline doesn't start or end in the secret corners of the hallways of the church. Church discipline happens every, it starts and it happens every single Sunday. 
It happens every time you come and, and worship Jesus. It happens every time you hear the, the word preached. It happens every time you're in a small group where you're admonishing one another, where you're encouraging one another. You can't have church discipline without having Christian discipleship happen inside the life of the church. That's where it starts because church discipline's aim is restoration and for you to look more like Christ. That's exactly what discipleship is. And so the church disciplines, the primarily, primary aim is for you to look holy, to be holy. Church discipline doesn't start or end with a cold, authoritative edict announced from on high. That's not how God went about redeeming his people. He didn't stay up there and say, hey, this is what you need to do. He came to this world, and we shouldn't be doing that either. And even in the end, I'll say this with church discipline. After every effort has been made, according to just a couple chapters later in Matthew 18, when you've gone to your brother or sister and said, hey, I'm concerned about something. I'm concerned what, what I'm seeing and, and help me understand, is there something going on in your life that, that I can be praying for that we need to talk about? And after you've done that, if that, that doesn't work well and they're still like, no, I'm good, thanks. Then you bring someone else and say, hey, we both care so much about you. We love you and we want you to look holy because you are holy. And after that, you've gone to the church and you said, hey, I need some help with that. After you've done all of that in grace and truth, pleading with the Lord on behalf of your brother and sister, doing it in all humility and not with pride, that they would see the errors of their ways and embrace the grace that the gospel has to offer. After you have done all of that, sometimes, although rarely, Church discipline leads to the church exercising her authority to bind and to loose by excommunication. This word that just sends off bells in everybody's mind, of course. But I want you, I want you to hear this, that even that is an act of grace. Think about how Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. It says this, that the aim of excommunication, Paul says this, is that the person's spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. It's not that they would be kicked out because they don't just belong here. No, we want them desperately to see the holiness of God and know that they are holy, that they are set apart, and that we hope that their soul is not gonna be lost forever. Even that is a severe act of mercy for God's people to take seriously the holiness, the fact that you're set apart, the fact that God has redeemed you and made you new. So any church that cares about the gospel will care about church discipline as its aim is to restore and reconcile believers to God and to fellow man through the power of the Spirit. It takes holiness seriously. And we as a church take it seriously as well. Now, I, I want to be clear again, make no mistake about it, Desiring to be a holy church, a set apart church, and a reflection of God's holiness, it doesn't mean that the church is for people who don't make mistakes. You might walk in and you might say, wow, there's a lot of pretty people out here. There's a lot of people that have their stuff together. I'm not sure I'm into this holiness thing. If that's what it means to be holy, that's not what the gospel talks about. Listen to this. Listen to J.C. Ryle and how he puts it. I love this. He said, this is talking about God. God, he often chooses the most unlikely and roughest stones and fits them into the most excellent work. He despises none and rejects none on account of former sins and past transgressions. He often makes Pharisees and publicans become spill pillars in his house. He delights to show mercy he often takes the most thoughtless, ungodly, and transforms them into polished corners of his spiritual temple. That's the kind of people that God uses. God uses people that are broken. God uses people that are sinful. God uses people like the author of 1 Corinthians, Paul, who used to be Saul, who went around and killed people in the church, and yet here he is, the chief among sinners, the Pharisee of Pharisees, Building God's church. That's the kind of people that are part of God's holy, separated church. John Owen says it like this. He says, holiness is nothing but the implanting, writing, and realizing of the gospel in our souls. And just as a reminder, the church is holy because we have a God who makes us holy through the hope that we have in the gospel. It's good news. 
It's good news for sinners who are set apart to be a distinct people out of darkness and into the glorious light. Holiness is not the only thing that we talk about, particularly as we look at the Apostles' Creed. The second thing we need to look at is the universal church. So we have the holiness of the church. Now we need to talk about the universal church. Now I wanna address a couple things right off the bat when we talk about this. Many of you have been sitting there week in and week out, and we've been reciting the Apostles' Creed, and we get to this line, and you're like the holy Catholic, wait, what, universal? Like, what? That's, not, that's not how it goes, right? That's not how I learned it growing up in Sunday school. What are these guys doing? And, and after you had the thought, that's not how I said it, you're like, man, who do these guys think they are? Changing church history for a thousand years, just changing the Apostles' Creed. And by the time you've gone through that thought process, you were saying amen on the Apostles' Creed and you missed the rest of the beautifulness of the Apostles' Creed. So to those of you that have thought that, and I know there are some of you, I wanna say this. The way you learned it is right. The way you recite it is true. It's wonderful, and there's beautiful truth behind it. In fact, I'll tell you that if Covenant Church operated like the Catholic Church and Trent was the Pope, we would be saying Holy Catholic Church because he wants to say that. But because he's gracious and we talked about it, we decided to use a synonym for Catholic, which is really getting at the idea of universal because we think it's more helpful for people to understand it in that way. Because I know that every time we say it, if you're not in the boat of like, hey, that's not how I learned it, and you're coming to this church and, and we're reciting the, the, the creed and, and you, uh, we get to it and you're like, holy Catholic church, ooh, I, I, that's not a part of what, what kind of church is this, right? That's what you start thinking. And so we thought it would be really helpful for folks to understand what this word really means and to help you do that by changing it to universal because they mean the same thing. And one other, there's another group of people, right, too. The people are like, all right, I get it. Right, we're not gonna say Catholic, but why don't we say Christian, the Holy Christian Church? There are other churches that do that. Well, the point of Holy Catholic or Holy Universal Church is not that it's a Christian church. There's no other church but the Christian church, so that's not a helpful qualifier. The, the point of the Holy Catholic Church or the Holy Universal Church is that it is universal, that it's Catholic, not that it is Christian because we already know that it is Christian. So that's why we decided to go with Holy Universal Church. So on the front end, I'll tell you that there's nothing wrong with you, if you go to another church or anything like that and you find yourself reciting Holy Catholic Church, just know that you're not saying anything that is heretical at all. You are merely, you're merely talking about the universality of the church. And Paul does that in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Let's take a, let's take a look back at that. To the church of God, that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now get this, called to be saints together with who? With all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Do you see again what Paul is doing? At first he starts with just the local church in Corinth. He says to you, church in Corinth, but he says, listen, this, this church thing is way bigger than just what you got right here. This is something that has happened across time and across space, and it's for everyone that has called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who's a part of the church, the true church. It's not just those that follow Apollos. It's not just those that follow Paul. It's not just those that come to our church on Sunday morning here at Covenant. No, it's with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord This is the true church. And I'll tell you, there's a dangerous trend that I've noticed, particularly in our American church context today, to become super hyper-localized. You'll hear people saying things like, "Why why do we need to go help this church or plant this church halfway across the world when we have churches that we can partner with here and we have people here that we can preach the gospel? Why do we need to go all around the world? I've heard, I've heard that all the time. I probably have even said it at some point. It's as if you must choose between the local church and the universal church. And I'll tell you that this is a false choice. It doesn't make sense. It's false 
because it fails to see that the local church is very much the same as the global church. There are saints that are here that are across the street from you and there are saints that are across the world from you. And I'll tell you that no amount of tunnel vision that we have to be hyper-localized can change that. It's not like we can be in a position to tell God who his people are. The universal church consists of people that are local, that are global, people that have gone before us, people that have come after us. It consists of people that look very different than us and have a different experience than us, but nevertheless, who have been brought near to the throne of grace. Just like you, believer, by the justifying and sanctifying work of God in you. I just, I wanna read the passage that so gets the, the essence of what it means to be and to think about the church universal in Revelation 7. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. He, John writes this, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. Do you long for this picture of the church? Do you long to be with those from every tribe, from every language, from every nation gathered around the throne room and know that you've been invited, not because of things that you've done, but because God is holy and has set you apart as his people and you're unified around the throne of grace, worshiping Jesus all the day long, saying worthy, worthy, worthy. That is what the church gets to do now and forevermore. This is the universal church. Not one in uniformity, but one people of diverse backgrounds and gifts united in the worship of our King. I'll tell you, I believe that it breaks God's heart, some of the divisions that he sees going on in his church today. And I'm talking about every kind of division. That's not a picture of division that I just read. That's not a picture of you doing your thing and me doing my thing. That's us worshiping together the King of Kings. I love the image of the palm branches coming down just like when he was entering Jerusalem. That's what we're gonna be doing, worshiping the King who has his rightful place on the throne as King over the whole universe, over the whole holy universal church. It's a beautiful picture of what it means to be the church. So the church is both holy, we've been set apart. We also are universal. We are Catholic in nature because we have seen that this is not just about right here, but it's across the world and across time. It's the true church who've been united by Christ through the power of the Spirit. But there's a couple things that we need to be careful of as we talk about the holiness and we talk about the unity that we have in the universal church. Particularly, there are three dangers that I wanna look at when we think about the church. The first, well, first I want want you to think about an X and Y axis graph. And for you non-math people like myself, that's one of these graphs that goes like this, all right? And so the, think about the, the, horizontal, the horizontal line. Think about that as the holiness. I'm getting there. The holiness and the vertical line as unity, okay? And you have more unity as you go up, you have more holiness as you move over. And I wanna think about what it means to be a church in each of those quadrants. And three of them are dangers and one is a beautiful picture of the church. And so let's start with a quadrant that has a lot of holiness in it, but not a lot of unity, right? A lot of holiness, but not a big picture of of the unity that we all have in Christ. I'm going to call that the whitewashed tomb. Take that right from the gospels, right? This is pharisaical in nature. This is, hey, I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to, I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be set apart. But you know what? I don't really care about the unity of the church that much. I don't care what other people are doing, but I know that I am going to be really, really holy, 
I don't care about the unity. Modern example of this, I saw this this week on one of our members, they posted a, a Facebook a message. It was kind of funny. And uh, it was a message of a church sign, which are always an adventure, posting church signs on social media. And on this sign, it was for a church, and it said this. It said, no hand clapping, no musical instruments. David would be in trouble there. Um, no, 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 no musical instruments, no baptizing babies. I'm in trouble there. No women preaching, no divine healing, spelled D-E-V-I-N-E, okay? And then it says, come in and ask questions. Okay, you know, walk in. And then they finally have Romans 16, 16, which says, uh, greet one another with a holy kiss. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure you're gonna think my mouth is holy to, to kiss you when I walk into this church. And I wanna be clear though, theological distinctives, they're okay, right? We have them here and we preach about them and we believe them, but we're not gonna put them on our church sign. And to become a member of this church, you don't need to believe every single theological distinctive that it takes to be a pastor in this church. It's okay to have distinct beliefs. But when the church, when, the, when they lead a church to emphasize so much the holiness, so much, hey, this is who we are, at the expense of the unity that, that we're bound in Christ, it puts up divisions and it separates people. And so that's the whitewashed tomb. That's a danger of the church to be really holy, but at the expense of doing it together with the church universal. And so now if we move from that quadrant up to the other quadrant where we have a lot of unity in the church, but we don't have a whole lot of holiness in the church. I call that emotionalism or liberalism, and I'm not talking politically, all right? This is a church that will have a sign on the door that says, hey, everybody's welcome to come on in. Well, am I welcome to come in? I'm not sure that's that, what that means. And, and then they sing together, they're like, kumbaya, my Lord, right, around the fire pit. They talk about God's love, and it's beautiful. But the more they talk about God's love year after year, the less it looks like the biblical kind of love that I'm used to that, hey, we're loved because we're sinners, because we don't deserve to be a part of this church, but God had to do something about that. They don't talk about that kind of love. So you get kind of emotionalism and you get liberalism and when unity is, 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 is held up above all else and it's emphasized at the expense of holiness, it results, I believe, in a big tent but not a lot of strong pillars to hold up that tent, not a lot of beliefs that are gonna be the foundation in which that church is built. And now if we move to the other quadrant where there's not a lot of holiness and there's not a lot of unity, that leaves us with anarchy. Think about this from the biblical perspective, and every man did what was right in their own eyes. If a church ever finds itself in that quadrant, and I'll tell you, churches have done that. The people of Israel have been in that quadrant before. It takes a prophet to go in there who deeply loves God, who deeply loves the people, who deeply loves God's word, and under the direction and the power of the Holy Spirit to call that people to repent. That's what happens when the church finds itself in that place. Of course, this leaves us with one last quadrant remaining, a church that emphasizes holiness and a church that emphasizes unity as well. And I'm calling that the communion of saints. Think about Acts 2 in this picture. This is communion of the saints where everyone is devoted to the apostles' teaching. Everyone is, is eager to hear from the Lord and they're doing it together. They're sharing meals together. They're sharing their possessions with one another and, and the love that God has for his people is, is clearly evident around those tables that they've gathered together and, they, and that Lord was adding to their number daily. And he was giving them favor with the people. This is what the communion of saints looks like. And I'll tell you, this ought to widen our view of what it means to be a church that is holy, that is universal, and that is, that is a communion of the saints. We have our communion with the Lord because we are united to him by the power of the Spirit. And so we get to do life together. This means not just here, right? This means that there's fellow believers in churches all around Naples, 
all around the world that we are united to. And I wanna give you a picture, a practical picture of the communion of the saints. It happened recently. I received a text message from someone in the congregation, a member, and the text message went like this. She said, my best friend, okay, who lives in Texas, okay, who was from Minnesota, okay, and maybe from my girlfriend's sister's church. I couldn't follow it. I'm, okay, they sent me this text, got it. She goes on to say, to give me the text from her girlfriend's sister's church who lived in Texas in Minnesota. She said this, there's a family from a church that I know in Minnesota that's adopting a baby who was just born right here in Naples and is in need of a couple things. And so I picked up the phone. I wasn't emotional when I called it, but I picked up the phone and uh, I said, hey, I'm not sure how I got your number or how we are connected, but I hear you're adopting a baby that was born in town and you could use a couple things. So we got a couple things sorted out, still not entirely sure how we got connected. And the Mercy Ministry team was able to come alongside this family and offer them a couple things that they needed. And we had sweet time of fellowship with this family. Sweet times, we got to talk about the Lord. We got to talk about what it's like to, to be in fellowship with one another. We got to talk about the things that, that hurt and the things that heal and the things that, that the Lord does to us that we can't even imagine. And I, I think back and I think, you know what? I should have called when I called her. I should have said, hey, I got your number because the communion of saints is pretty amazing. This is the picture of the church. This is the church in action. This is a church that has been called to be set apart. This is a church that is, that is united across states, across time. This is a church that is holy. I believe in the holy universal church and the communion of saints. Let's pray. God, thank you that unite us believers when we don't deserve it. Thank you that you communicate to us by your word and that we know who you are because you have revealed yourself to us. God, thank you for your goodness to your people. May we live more and more like the holy universal church and the communion of saints. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.